Uh, when there was quite a lot of bleeping happening in the first session, so please make sure that you've got notifications and enable your phone to turn those off, or at least put them on silent. Thanks very much. Great. Shall I start? Um, yes. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Zara Talantari, and um, I am from the Department of uh, Physical Geography. Uh, besides uh, Regina, uh, Lynn Boy, and Christopher Hillander, so we are um, research area leaders of RA7, which is about landscape processes and climate. In this research area, we are focusing on effects of the climate, land, and water use on ecosystems at the landscape scale relevant for management and governance of ecosystem services. So during this session, uh, we will um, listen to different talks. And uh, uh, to start with, I would ask Bodil Elmhagen, please. Where is Bodil? Yes, great. To talk about the climate and land use effect on species interactions, please. Uh, Great, floor is yours, please. You don't need to, yeah, you don't need, uh, here is this uh, oh. microphone. Okay, it's just so stay closer to it. No, you okay. don't need to. Thank you. Um, thank you, nice to see so many people here today. Um, I'm uh, Bodilem Hagen, I used to work at the Department of Zoology. I'm still affiliated to the department, but I now work at the Zoology Association for Hunting and Wildlife Management. Mm -hmm but I have some time for research within my position there. And basically, my, what I'm working with is how species interactions and the effects on species interactions on species distributions and abundances, how they are affected by climate and land use, for example. And I will give some examples of my research. Uh, basically, this is how we often think about ecosystem. We have lots of resources. We have wildlife like hares and deer that feed on the resources, that feeds in turn carnivores. But on the other hand, we can also have carnivores feed on the uh, uh, herbivores and or smaller carnivores. So we can have sort of interaction pathways both from bottom up resources and top down through predation and grazing on the resources. However, uh, most ecosystems do not look really like that. We have humans in them and they can affect all species through hunting and uh, through sort of fear, changing their uh, behaviors. And they also affect the resource distribution through land use and climate change. However, when we're looking at the cascading direct and indirect effects of, for example, large carnivores, we have a strong research bias towards relatively unaffected ecosystems, that, such as North American national parks. And uh, one of the hypotheses that has come from that research is that we can potentially use large carnivores to buffer against or compensate for land use and climate change that humans are affecting. So basically, if we have a species being favored by, for example, land use and resource change, if that species is negatively affected by large carnivores, maybe those sort of different effects can compensate for each other in some way. And that's something I've been looking at, looking at the lynx and the red fox, where lynx sometimes kill red foxes and therefore can have a negative effect on, lynx, on red fox abundance. We did this in uh, this landscape, uh, Nordström. And in Nordström, you have seen over time since the 19th century about a 1.6 increase in yearly mean temperature. We have seen substantial land use change uh, with um, larger, more homogeneous landscapes, but also more fields since the 19th century. Uh, both these factors, warmer winters and uh, more cropland in the landscape, favors the, the red fox. Uh, but then again, we also have the lynx, which potentially could uh, suppress red fox abundance. Uh, we use this information to um, and uh, species abundance data from Finland and parts of Sweden 
to sort of estimate the effect of winter cropland and lynx on the red fox and then use that to sort of hypothetically see how would the red fox abundance have changed since the 19th century and potentially in the future. And we have all the numbers down here and here is sort of what I hope to be, uh, it looks very confusing now, uh, some kind of simplified picture. Uh, basically, uh, green colors show that there are less foxes than uh, uh, purple colors. So we have more foxes now than in the 19th century. Um, in the mid-1830s, we would expect that we had relatively few foxes and relatively much lynx. Then lynx went extinct and red foxes were favored by climate change and more cropland in the landscapes. So potentially fox abundance doubled. Uh, lynx partly recolonized, but that would not suppress red foxes back to the low level that it had, uh, partly because we have less lynx, but also because they are simultaneously favored by the milder winters and more cropland. If we go into the future, if we would like to keep uh, red fox presence at, or abundance at this level, uh, we would have to increase the number of lynx. Uh, if we don't, uh, the red fox abundance will increase again, uh, back to about this level. And to stop that, we would have to increase lynx abundance with about 79%, which is quite substantial. So in that sense, it would be possible, but would it work from an animal perspective? That is, would lynx actually increase to that level and have such strong effects on uh, red foxes if the landscape and climate changes? And at present, we are looking more into details in Finland, uh, where there is uh, data since 1989 on lynx recolonization and fox abundance. And what we see there, if we compare, for example, this area and this area, uh, which differs a bit. This is a colder area with more homogeneous landscapes. This is a warmer uh, landscape with more agriculture, more prey species for lynx. And um, we see that in both areas, lynx has increased almost exactly uh, um, as much. But in this simpler ecosystem and colder ecosystem, that has driven uh, the red fox abundance to almost uh, be halved. Whereas in this area, it decreases, but it's much less compared to the already high fox abundances. And we also see much more variation in the effect of lynx on red foxes. We don't know why yet, but potentially because we have other factors in this landscape, which sort of means that lynx are not as inclined to kill red foxes in the more uh, complicated landscape with more other species, etc. Um, we also see that lynx do not get more prone to kill red foxes when there are more red foxes. They basically kill the same number if they are few or if there are many, which means that in effect they will not be able to pr presumably increase the kill rate to compensate for other effects. Uh, they simply won't do it. Uh, so back to which is a review then. Uh, we uh, concluded that large carnivore effects in human dominated landscapes were probably quite weak because we counteract some of the effects by increasing resource availability for many prey species of large carnivores, and we probably do not have the human tolerance for the high carnivore abundances that we would need to actually sort of use them as a tool to uh, reduce uh, the response of other species to changes in resource abundance. In low productivity landscapes, maybe we could see some effect because we don't need that many large carnivores there. And we could see some behavioral effects because that also do not require as many carnivores. So what happens if we go north? Well, at present or in the last 50 years, we have seen northern expansions and increases in some southern species, like roe deer, badgers, and jackdaw as an example. Uh, this is the bag statistics from 1960 in uh, Jämtland, tested Wotton further north, and then Norrbotten in the far north. And as you can see, even though it goes up and down a bit, the species are establishing and increasing further and further north, as suggested by this data. That will also go for, of course, carnivores that will follow in their footsteps. And if we go back to the lynx and red fox example, uh, the orange here is the red fox distribution globally, and the hatched black part are where there are lynx in Eurasia or coyotes in uh, North America, which both are known to suppress red foxes. 
In the far north, however, red foxes do not overlap with these larger carnivores, which means that they are sort of probably primarily responding to increased resource abundance of climate change or land use change. In such areas, we have shown at Stockholm University uh, from the Swedish mountain range, uh, that means that red foxes can have a negative effect on the smaller arctic fox, which decreases its abundance and distribution, basically through killing them, competing for resources, food, uh, dens, etc. Uh, in Sweden, if we're looking at what determines uh, red fox abundance or distribution locally uh, within a mountain area, uh, we still see that it's very strongly attached to the areas where we have highest resource abundance. Uh, for example, in winters, independent of the amount of small rodents, which is an important prey, we see them strongly attached to alternative prey, ptarmigan, which seems then to both have sort of a favoring effect on red fox abundance. So they basically try to be where the resources are. Uh, if we go out into the big world, into the Arctic, and compare uh, what we see in Scandinavia, we see red foxes typically closely related to uh, resources. Uh, and in relation to red foxes, uh, we have sort of a relatively warm, this is the mean annual uh, precipitation and temperature sort of um, position of different places in the Arctic where they have been studying Arctic and red fox interactions. And we see that in one sphere, which is relatively warm, uh, we see negative effects of red fox expansion on arctic fox distribution and population density. Uh, climate seems to be an important driver because we always see red foxes in the, we have lots of different research on this, I just give you the overview. Uh, we have, uh, tend to always have red foxes establishing in the most productive areas when they go up into the mountains. So there seems to be a climate related aspect, but they can also be favored by different subsidies. For example, um, Local changes in reindeer management, which means that reindeer are kept on the mountains, die on the mountains, provides carcasses which allow the red fox to establish. In the far north, we usually see stable populations of red foxes, but with one exception where we have studied them, uh, up here in Alaska, where red foxes have established the black lines over time, increasing number of red foxes uh, reproducing, at the same time a decrease in the number of arctic foxes reproducing, this is north of the climate-imposed distribution limit of the red fox, but it's an area where human development industries provide resources through garbage, etc., which then allows the red fox to establish north of its distribution line. So to sum up, uh, what I'm looking at, or my whole research area, is to see how species interactions change in these kinds of landscapes, not only because of the actual interaction, but also through the changes in the landscape that occurs, which favor some species and then indirectly not favor others. And I'm continuing this research with my postdoc, uh, looking at the red fox primarily, how the dynamics over a long time and in the future will change due to all these different kinds of drivers. Thank you. So, uh, wonderful study, and you describe. Is this on? Uh, yeah, okay. um, so, you describe the red fox as going north of its historical climate limit because of addition of resources by humans. So, does that mean the historical boundary of, of, of the species range really isn't a climate limitation? That it really is a resource limitation and it just superficially looks like a climate limitation? Yeah, that's basically the hypothesis um, as sort of formulated that the red fox, it's, for example, it's not as well insulated, it doesn't have as thick fur as the arctic fox, it, but it's larger and it needs more resources. Um, but at least at our sort of, um, in our climate, it's not the actual cold that is the main problem. It is that it doesn't have, find enough food to sustain itself compared to smaller species, presumably. So if you provide that, they can sort of survive the harsh climate, but uh, they cannot. So, so it's sort of basically the, the, that the climate effect is more strongly mediated through uh, food abundance and resources. Okay. 
Okay, and it, it's not possible that there's a bit of an urban warming effect, that it's actually finding warmer microclimates because of human habitation increasing the temperature? Because that's usually about a two degree difference. Yeah, I, I think in this area, it's sort of uh, oil development areas. So I don't think it's sort of enough. I wouldn't imagine it's urban enough. It would be if they can actually find some, I don't know, curl up until the building or something. But uh, in this case, I don't think so. And in other parts of the tundra, like in Russia, they also see, the, see these examples that if there is a big die off of reindeer, for example, uh, red fox tend to become more abundant, but not as abundant um, over sustainable time. Then. So provide the resources, and in this particular species, they will go there. Uh, but of course, there would probably be limits as well, but the, the uh, resource distribution limit is more northern than the climate one. Good. Thank you. So we continue with the next speaker, Mar Martin Bustron, talking about the coastal blue carbon Yeah. Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm um, based on uh, Deep, the department uh, close to this here, as you know. And there, I am running a research group together with Professor Mats Bjork, and a number of excellent PhD students and postdocs. And one of our main topics there is coastal blue carbon research. So this is what I will talk about. So I would start off with what is actually blue carbon. First of all, as you may know, uh, black carbon and brown carbon, that's the carbon that we have. Uh, humans emit uh, to the atmosphere. And blue carbon is actually a subset of different types of carbon. And it's related to the green carbon. Green carbon is uh, the carbon trapped in the, in the ecosystems, different ecosystems, and it often is referring to the forests. Uh, but also blue carbon is a subset of the green carbon. And there you can divide this into the oceanic part and the coastal part. And we are focusing on the coastal part, which is related to, referred to, I would say, mangroves, seagrass meadows, and salt marshes. And why the coastal part? Because it's so efficient in sequestering carbon, much more than the terrestrial environment. Uh, and although it's a uh, much less global area, it is a very important uh, uh, system or the systems in the coastal zone as uh, they trap a lot of carbon through the boreal. It has a very efficient uh, process. The log scale is even even bigger difference compared to the temperate environment. Related to the sequestration, it's also very efficient. Those systems in storing the carbon, and that's because they store it below below ground, so to speak, uh, most of the carbon. While the tropical and boreal forests, they have less carbon sequestered and stored, and they store a large part of the biomass. And this is, of course, related to the climate because it can mitigate climate change because it's a natural carbon sink, which is dynamic and affected in many ways by us. If you look at the global scale, you can see that those three coastal systems covering the whole globe's coastal zones. Uh, salt marshes you find uh, in the temperate system, mangroves in the tropical and subtropical system, White seagrasses you find all over the world, on all continents, except in Antarctica. They are also, of course, very important, all those systems, and provide a large number of ecosystem services and ecological functions. And with seagrass ecosystems, which is the focus of our, most of our research, although we work also with mangroves, uh, apart from the carbon sink function, they have a very important role as nursery grounds for many marine fishes and invertebrates, uh, including commercial ones. Increased biodiversity, habitat for many organisms. 
it's extremely important in nutrient recycling and stabilizing sediment and thereby also controlling the water uh, quality. It's also a system which is extremely important for millions of people for food, for protein, for livelihood, because it's a lot of productivity here in those systems and for fishing. Unfortunately, there's a huge regression of those habitats. So the annual loss up to several percent every year <coughs> since decades. So about between 25 and 35 percent of the all those low carbon systems have have um, yeah. Yeah, fragmented or been lost. So going to the process of, of this low carbon storage, I will just sim give you a simplified uh, scheme here. Uh, you have the carbon dioxide is taken up for, through photosynthesis by the plants, and uh, it's fixed in the, in the in the leaves. And then you have another part of organic matter coming from outside the system, so to speak, electronically from, for example, land or, or the out in the oceans, and uh, which is then coming to the detritus part directly. Uh, and uh, this links up with the other part. As you saw, part of the, the fixed carbon in the plants goes away because of, uh, for example, grazing and export different reasons. Then all this carbon, part of this will be degraded or disappear because of microbial activity, but a huge part will go to the to the storage part here. And this is very simplified, of course, and there are many things to talk about. But this was a simplified way to talk about the short-term storage, how it becomes long-term storage. So about the driving processes of this, uh, we are working with a number of different uh, types of studies here. I will give you just a, an overview of some of those. Uh, for example, first of all, we have been looking into the carbon storage. How does it how does it vary actually across latitudes and everything? So we have been in Europe, in different parts of Europe, all from the Swedish part to the Mediterranean, Atlantic, Black Sea, and so on. We have also been across the entire um, East Africa, from from uh, Northern Tanzania down to Mozambique and Madagascar and so on. And we, actually interesting, we could see that the Swedish record is very special. Here is a bar for the global average of organic carbon, while at the Swedish West Coast you can see it's much higher, and it's actually higher than anywhere else. And some of the sites are actually double this or even triple this, uh, which is interesting. So one of the studies we did in the temperate systems was also to try to correlate those carbon storage uh, results with uh, the predictors that could potentially be the, the drivers. And what we found is that the sediment is extremely important. Uh, it depends on if it's a fine grain size of the um, carbon, um, the sediment, sorry, and uh, how for the porosity, sediment density, and so on. Uh, which are more important than the seagrass variables and the water conditions in this case. Also from the tropical we, uh, analysis, we found that sediment is extremely important, but also we tested it to see if the landscape actually has a role. We have just done a first uh, assessment of this and just see that it's actually correlated with the landscape configuration. It's high organic carbon in areas where you have more seagrass compared to the other systems or other, other habitats. But this needs uh, further work to understand this more particular, what type of carbon and so on. Then we have, <coughs> totally destroyed, but uh, we have done uh, uh, testing the disturbance effect on car low carbon. We did a five month field study, or my PhD students did a five month field study on Zanzibar, where we, um, looked into the effects of shading and clipping, which is related, it's mimicking the disturbances on seagrasses around the world, like eutrophication and sedimentation, mimicked by the shading, and clipping is more of an overexploitation of uh, some of the important uh, animals, like from overfishing and through the uh, cascade effect. And we looked at many different variables as responses, all from sediment to physiology to 
methane to animals and so on. And there are three papers published on, on this. Here is just to show you the area where we have a shaded and boundary clipping and so on. And some of the results, one very important, one very clear result is actually that the methane emission increased by up to six times when we destroyed the seagrass. And also, uh, we could see that it was a decreased accumulation of organic carbon, the seagrass was more, <coughs> yeah. it was related to many processes. Sediment erosion was one of the effects of, of the disturbance, and so on. I just wanted to give you some parts of this, and you can see then that it turns actually to uh, get more carbon dioxide and carbon in different forms out of the system. Finally, I would like to say also something about the latest uh, research we have done in, in Madagascar, where we look at uh, effects of mangrove degradation on the seagrass system. Because we are involved in a global project with other uh, research groups, and we are leading the work of uh, looking into, here you have the seagrass area, the dotted red area. And here the mangrove has been the forest a few years ago, and we look at the effects close to the forested area and the deforested area out on different seagrasses, different distances from this. And we look into the, of course, the carbon, how much it is, but also what type of carbon and so on, what age of the carbon. We have not done all that analysis, but what you can see so far, just preliminary, we have higher carbon in the, the forested area, likely because it's a process from the mangrove. So, summing up some things we have done, we have seen in our research that sediment properties has a rule for carbon storage, landscape configuration, anthropogenic disturbance, and to some, some uh, degree also plant size and meadow structure, while some other factors are also important according to the literature. What we have started a little bit, but what we don't know so much about is the faunal community, for example, the biodiversity. Microbial community, which is certainly extremely important to understand processes. Long-term storage, what, is, what do we mean? How much? It could be uh, stored for thousands of years, but we don't know exactly. And also carbonate production, which we have started to work with, which can actually turn a seam to source in some of the areas, for example, in very calcareous areas in the uh, Zanzibar in Tanzania and so on. So I would like to thank the whole group for amazing work and of course funders and collaborating scientists. And I will announce also Martin Dahl who is sitting here somewhere there. He will defend his thesis the 15th of December here at DEEP. Then a day on the 16th of uh, <coughs> February uh, and also at DEEP. Uh, and uh, I hope you will come. So finish up. Seagrass. Carbon research could be fun and easy and so on. It could be a bit more tricky. It could be really hard and tricky. <laughs> and sometimes even impossible or close to impossible. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for your interesting talk. So please. Thank you for your uh, interesting talk. And um, I was—I um, uh, have no experience on seagrass work, but I worked on on halophytes and salt marshes. So one of the things about the—I was checking the importance of predictors, and you haven't mentioned, but have you checked whether the covariates are actually independent? Because it's it's quite important, I think, to spurious yeah. correlation. You mean the correlation? Yeah. yeah, it is. I mean, we we have tested many of them independently, and. This technique, the modeling technique, takes care of that also. This. Yeah, some of them. But we, <laughs> yeah, we have, uh, I will. Look into it. It's on. Yeah, I. I, uh, I was, uh, a lot of. It's it's not on. All right. Okay. A, a lot a lot of a, a lot of uh, terrestrial carbon storage, in fact, is going into pools with a very short 
turnover time. It's not really sequestered at all, and it's very subject to r rapid release under degradation, such as you find in seagrass. But I was, I was wondering if there have been any C14 studies or anything like that that indicate whether there is an old carbon pool and associated with the seagrass, or whether it's all in, say, the centennial scale or less. Yeah, there are some studies looking into this very much. We are actually doing it in our last study, but we have not started this. So, uh, you mean the age of the... Yeah, yeah that's... I mean, uh, real real long-term sequestration yes. yeah, of carbon has to be on the millennial scale. Yeah, that, the that's centennial what they scale have doesn't seen help that much. it's thousands yeah. of years. Yeah, 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 yeah. With yeah. C14, yeah, yeah, yeah. A few of them. Actually, that, that was one of my questions as well, as whether you're beginning to look at dating the, yeah, the age of the sediment. that's what we are doing in the last. Right. We are uh, collaborating with the lab in Australia on this. The other question I had, because we... expensive part of it. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's our experience as we well. Um, the other question I had was regarding the differences between your east and west coast, uh, or sorry, your Baltic versus your west um, coast of Sweden eelgrass beds. You said they were Amsostera um, marina. Are they exclusively... Um, one species, or we, are you dealing um, with most, multiple species? In Europe, we have done a study. It's published here by Martin and us, okay. other. <laughs> yeah, you should. But anyway, uh, then it was Sostra Marina. And uh, so we, we were in the sort of edges. So we were Baltic Sea, Swedish West Coast, and we took, we have sites in the Bo uh, Black Sea and the Atlantic Coast, along the Atlantic Coast of Portugal. And that's Sostra Marina. But when we work in East Africa, we are, we are looking into actually the effect of, I didn't show this, but it's an effect of species. And the more the made, yes, right? exactly. So both above ground and below ground differs a lot there. And that we can see also in the results of East Africa. But I could not show uh, everything yet. But that's okay. an effect. Thank you, Martin. Okay, so thank you. We need to move on, so please, Henrik. Um, talking about environmental modeling and model-based maps. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here, and thank you for the invitation. And uh, I, I'm working at the Swedish University of Agriculture Science, and I'm up in Umeå, and I'm partly connected to NILS, this uh, inventory program that is uh, cited there, and I'm also working as a researcher at the uh, group with landscape studies as well. And the only thing you need to remember from this talk is maybe that we have a bunch of data, long-term data, that is a treasure to dig into and could be related to climate uh, research and land use and things like that. Um, so, um, more, maybe. This research is uh, mainly policy-driven monitoring. So the government, or in this case, uh, sorry, it's, uh, <laughs> it was not only the. Uh, <laughs> Can we just have nobody sitting underneath it at the moment? We've already sent to the technical people. So yeah, Karen, you're in the last um, and uh, we'll just carry on. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Nobody could forget your talk. No. <laughs> that, that's, uh, but not for this right reason, maybe. But uh, anyway, uh, I was going to say that uh, the monitoring area, uh, no one will be listening after this. Uh, technical research. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that it's mainly policy driven monitoring. And, uh, uh, the Swedish National Forest Inventory, for example, started back in 1923, and by the king, uh, something happens there. Uh, because 
actually no one know they didn't have a clue how much timber do we have in the forest uh, how much do we cut or how much re is regenerated so that's one reason why it started uh, but after a while nowadays but it's more even more maybe about environmental issues it's about carbon stock and it's uh, reported to different uh, international and national uh, reports, yeah. And it's a part of the official statistics. Uh, another one is uh, we needed to get data about nat Natura 2000 habitats, for example, for the species and habitat reporting. And TUF is uh, Terrestrial Habitat Defining is one of these. They do gather data from other inventories like the NFI and NILS, which I don't talk about, and it's, but they also have an own unique uh, inventory along the coast, uh, looking on the Natura 2000 habitats. Another one at our department is uh, Teen, uh, but about butterflies and bumblebees, and it's uh, related to this environmental object, a varied uh, agricultural landscape and also policy driven and we have the one i'm mostly connected to uh, nils and should answer a question about this swedish environmental objects to be able to follow up at least some of these process uh, goals that is in this and uh, i will put a little bit more focus on this because that's why I, why i was invited but i will also give you some results uh, as an example. Uh, the purpose was uh, monitoring the prerequisites of, for biological, biological diversity and uh, we look in the whole landscape of Sweden. So it's the Swedish everyday landscape, so it's everything. And we have used the same methodology more or less in all terrestrial habitats. So from High alpine area to uh, the boring uh, road, narrow roads and things like that. Uh, Man-made uh, um, uh, what's, what's structures. Thank you. Uh, and the use of this data is for environmental reporting, applied research, and hopefully it was also affect land use policy development, environmental. Uh, policies. The design is a sample based monitoring program. It's a representative sample for whole Sweden. In five years, we go through the whole Sweden, and each year is a representative sample. So it's the same. Uh, it's part of um, its permanent plots, I would say, also. Uh, and the way is three interconnected uh, inventories. One area of photo interpretation, we'll, we'll look on land use and we look on uh, spatial patterns and things like that. It's a little bit on the hold at the moment, but we are actually not going forward in that one, we are going backwards. So we are looking on the eight, 90s and the 50s, 60s uh, with old aerial photos instead. And uh, then we have this field inventory. One part is these uh, 12 field plots. Uh, and we have also 12 sample lines in between. This is uh, circular sample plots uh, that we are looking on. And we collect data about land use, mountains, habitats, Natura 2000 habitats, management activities, and uh, Three layer canopy cover, and we are looking on the vegetation. Both uh, uh, the cover of shrubs divided on species and group of species, seed layer on groups of uh, uh, species, and both bottom layer as well. It's different groups. Well. And we are looking on the ground so we can relate the vegetation to the uh, description, ground description. And uh, elements of the vegetation in myers and things like that. And we're also looking on different species of vascular plants in smaller plots. 
might change in a couple of years. Um, liner transects. It's 200 meters in between all these plots, so they, in each square they are 2.4 kilometers they are walking around in this. And when they reach a liner object, they stop there, note it, and um, also take in quality data about this uh, object. So it could be transport roads like vesicle tracks and things like that, like this in Meyer. It could be roads, it could be stone walls, ditches, and things like that. And this is just some example of uh, results from this. For example, uh, the aerial extension of alpine habitats is uh, 3.2 million uh, hectares in Sweden. And a little bit less of mountain birch forest. We can look on the canopy cover. Of course, it's higher canopy cover in the mountain birch forest, and less in the alpine area. But if you're looking and doing change analysis, there is actually a change from the first phase to the second phase that is significant in the alpine area. But hard to see on this graph uh, figure. <laughs> Um, we divide it, as I said, also the vegetation group in the field layer. It could be dwarf shrubs, gramonoids, and herbs, and ferns, and things like that. And also in the Alpine era, we have a significant increase of dwarf shrubs and actually also gramonoids between the first and the second phase. We are actually in just finishing this year the third phase of this. Uh, Vesicle tracks, one example, it's also different from the first phase to the second phase in the Elton era. Um, we have uh, covers of vegetation in meadows, we have uh, stone walls, uh, lengths and location. We have actually 140,000 <laughs> kilometers of stone walls in Sweden. Uh, a lot of it is in the edges between different habitats. Uh, we also have a lot in the forest today. Are you counting that this, this happened as well? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we can actually find pressures and things like that as well. This is long term data from the NFI back in 1922. And we can see here dead wood. You see the effect of the storm in 1969. You can see the effect of the Forestry Act in 1993, and increase of uh, deadwood. Then I'm not talking about the quality, of course, but the amount of uh, deadwood. We are doing uh, model maps. We are using uh, NFI data for Bilberry. We are using Nils data for Rainy Lichens. We are combining data from NILS to make habitats for Tatarmigan, and we are using citizen data from the Species Information Center to m make these models. And we're using this field data, connect them with the statistical model. Uh, we use different metrics and things like that. Canopy cover tree height, for, for example, is from the remote forest remote sensing section that does this forest map as well. Uh, with the full covers. We can do maps of larger area and we can do scenarios with this uh, decision support system Rekia which uh, optimize and compare different scenar scenarios. So it's a little bit hard but the green dot here is more uh, uh, potential for reindeer lichens. And we can compare scenarios with more reindeer like an adapted uh, scenario management. And we can put this in decision support tools like this one used by reindeer herders for uh, when they are doing uh, uh, consulting with other in stakeholders in the area. And the darker, the more reindeer like us. And hopefully next. So, 
now I end. Uh, so this uh, monitoring, large-scale monitoring, could be used to see if these uh, uh, experimental results from small scale or small scale monitoring could be generalized over large scale area. This is from Arbisco uh, uh, warming experiment. Does this result uh, could be could that be generalized for the whole mountain range? And um, also following up of all vegetation studies in in Arbisco, for example, could that be generalized over um, the whole mountain range. So a combination of uh, modeling, and monitoring, large scale and small scale monitoring, and more question part is that uh, could also give more uh, ecological knowledge, I think, and knowledge about how climate affects. And we, in this model, if you also include climate, you can also tweak this and see if that has effect and do scenarios also for climate. Was something else I was going to say, but anyway. Uh, I thank a lot of colleagues that have been part of this, in particular the modeling man, Sven Adler. Great, Hey, is there any uh, idea on why the amount of dead wood increased uh, during the recent years? Is it because the people do not collect the dead wood anymore, or is it really that there's more dead wood? From yeah, the it's a, it's um, it's a management thing. Ah, it should be um, the forest companies think about the environmental and then leave this uh, uh, dead wood actually, and uh, that's why. Good, thank you. So now, so far we have the projector in place, so we will continue. Uh, we will have the four talks left uh, from uh, the project that uh, have got funded from our research area. Uh, please, Lina, you start. And I have to say that these talks are really short. It's about three minutes, so yes. Exactly, two, three minutes we got, but uh, and of course we haven't started yet, so here's a very sort of big picture overview of some of the thinking behind this proposal. But it's called, uh, uh, we call it remote and local drivers of tipping points, uh, of water tipping points. And uh, I think we have uh, at the, some of my research and some of the colleagues at SSC that I've been working with is related to regime shifts, this type of thresholds in ecosystems that often exhibit hysteretic effects. So once you piss, uh, you cross, <laughs> sorry, I, I get so stressed. <laughs> once you cross the threshold, it's really hard to, to get back. And we did an overview of where can we see that humans have influenced the hydrological cycle in a way that are causing these regime shifts, uh, uh, and especially through the land use change in agriculture. And we saw them in river systems and downstream systems. We saw them in the soil uh, interface where water is infiltrating. And we saw them in relation to how we shape, changing the way that water flows to the atmosphere and then comes back at rainfall. Um, and the sort of strength of the uh, blackness here, gray versus black, also indicates sort of where we see uh, evidence. So we have much more evidence for regime shift downstream than this related to um, uh, the atmospheric recycling of water. Uh, so there is a large uh, outstanding mm -hmm. research gap also related to these more atmospheric processes. Uh, we've also tried spatially to look at regions globally or where do we see larger risks for different types of tipping points. And at the same time that we've been developing these ideas also here at the physical geography uh, Gia Di Stoni and Fernando Jaramillo has also been re uh, working on water-related regime shifts and tipping points, and also especially on these uh, changes in evapotranspiration and how that uh, are also altering these risks. So we thought, let's bring these type of insights together uh, and work together on understanding water and regime shifts better. Uh, 
we also want to do this a little bit more focusing on this, what I say, moist recycling, which basically is a process of evaporation, how that then returns down as rainfall. Um, and we've done this uh, in a project. Um, we had two PhD students recently finishing from this uh, project, where we looked also at land use change and how that influences these processes. And we worked a lot with the hydrological community, but less actually with atmospheric scientists in this project. We also brought in Annika uh, Ekman at uh, MISU to, to sort of help also with understanding these atmospheric components much better in this project. Uh, so while we've been waiting for funding for this project, we've also had other people at, uh, uh, in our sort of network getting funded for actually quite similar research. So Johan Rockström has a big grant, ERC grant on earth system tipping points, where he's also interested in hydrological aspects. And then uh, Lan Wang, who was my PhD student, she just got a grant to look at some of these things related to groundwater extraction, but based in Kyoto in Japan. We thought, let's bring it together and, and, and make sure that we use this as opportunities of, of actually doing more in-depth work. So the PhD student working with Johan was going to focus more on forests, land, as I said, on groundwater. And we thought that we sort of focus in this postdoc working more on dry land systems globally. Uh, so the, the focus will be on these water-related tipping points, but especially related to dry land. And we want to see then what are the roles of water di dynamic and shifts in precipitation and runoff dynamics in creating tipping points. And also integrating with more social data. So some of these hysteric effects are not only in the biophysical system, but they're actually causing shifts between, for example, the ability to cultivate crops versus having livestock systems or uh, risks of migration. So we are now looking for someone, and here I'm hoping that you have good ideas, of candidates that are really good at working with large-scale data, modeling, hopefully very excited about bringing biophysical and social sciences together in this project. I hope we had the ad up by now, but we're, uh, it's coming up this week, I think, for a postdoc. So encourage anyone that you know who is a, a good collaborator to apply. Thanks. Uh, we can take questions, yes. One question, please. Do you mind? Yes. So, um, it, to me, it's largely a semantic issue, it's a very basic issue. But, um, I, I, in my view, tipping points and regime shifts are not exactly synonymous. No, it's not actually. I, I agree. And I, I didn't have time to go into it. And yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but, but I think what we're interested in, especially, is this. Uh, when they are exhibiting these hysteretic effects, so that you, you, I mean, tipping points doesn't necessarily have to have these hysteretic effects. I mean, you maybe have a big shift in the system, but as soon as you reduce that driver that brought it there, you get it back. But hysteretic ones is when you reduce that driver, and it, you have to reduce it substantially more. We have to change it substantially more to actually get it back. So that's kind of maybe. But yeah, I was a bit sloppy in my... No, <laughs> just three minutes. Yeah. We also have some colleagues here, so I'm here in the, uh, in the audience in Gary has been working on, on synthesizing uh, regime shifts and have a, developing a database on regime shifts also in both social and social Yeah. So, Stefano Manzuni, please. Thank you. Uh, just a very quick summary in three minutes. But basically, with this newly funded Research Area 7 project, we would like to study the uh, unintended consequences of quote unquote improved water use in agricultural systems. We know that water resources are limited, so that's not, not big news, especially in the tropics where uh, uh, already now we are seeing changes in seasonality. As you can see from this uh, map here by Xu Feng in 2013, in some places, uh, the brown areas here, the wet season rainfall is decreasing. In other places, the dry season length is increasing. So in most places, uh, conditions are getting a bit drier. 
So uh, to face this challenge of decreased water availability, um, various water management solutions have been proposed, and they all aim to uh, somehow increase the efficiency or the effectiveness of water use, especially in agricultural systems. But we argue that these uh, approaches can actually have unintended consequences. Uh, in particular, in the provision of ecosystem services downstream and locally. So our approach with this project is to um, study the coupled carbon and water cycles in tropical areas with the focus on uh, uh, agricultural regions. And uh, specifically, we'll be looking at four uh, research sites uh, in Costa Rica, Brazil, Tanzania, and Vietnam that uh, are already part of other ongoing projects. So with this RA7 project, we'll try to really synthesize information from these other ongoing activities. And uh, uh, just to give you some examples to show what I mean by unintended consequences of improved, quote unquote again, improved water management. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to briefly summarize the ideas behind this new RA7 project about hydroclimatic change and large-scale sustainability of ecosystem services of wetlands that could be constructed, restored, or unmanaged wetlands. Uh, it's a collaboration then between physical geography, so Andrew, myself, Josephine, and Gia. And we have uh, from deep uh, Peter Hambeck, and also human geography, uh, Ulf Jansson. Um, and an important motivation for, for this project is the like ongoing rather large efforts to restore wetlands and also construct new wetlands in Sweden and elsewhere. Uh, partly supported by EU uh, grants. Uh, and uh, the question is, do they make a difference? What do they do this, you know, on, on, uh, for society and ecosystem services? And then we would like to look also not at the scale of individual wetlands, but also on larger scale, where probably we have the interactions with climate. So if we want to understand also how this will work in the future, we have to account for uh, climate change. So that's uh, an important uh, motivation. Uh, the other ones is, uh, of course, what, what do we know and what don't we know? I mean, on individual scales of, of wetlands, there are many studies connecting ecosystem services such as nutrient retention to like uh, water flow and changing climate. You can do it based on geometry, you know, how the wetlands work in retaining nutrients. It's then much more difficult uh, to uh, check, you know, uh, what happens with ecosystem services under climate change. In, in this, uh, so, so under this condition. And the basic bearing idea here is to check if there are key hydrological characteristics of wetlands that correlate with wetland biodiversity. So it's a big question and it's very patchy knowledge in this area. And then why do we want to check for such correlations? Well, they are very useful if we want to predict what happens in the future uh, with ongoing climate change what will happen with the ecosystem services of constructed and or unmanaged <laughs> wetlands uh, in the future. And we recognized that we have at the different departments rather huge data sets uh, about hydrology, uh, about different uh, biodiversity of, of different uh, ecosystems. And uh, so we want to focus on, to, the, to begin with, on different sites where we have worked a lot. And in addition to this, we also want to draw from the experience from human geography about management uh, of, of wetlands. 
Um, so some of the sites are North Nordstrom, Lake Mellern Basin, which you saw earlier today, where we have eutrophication problems. Uh, Peter has uh, collabor ongoing collaboration on the Swedish wet coast with numerous constructed wetlands. And uh, there are different kinds of problems and data in these data sets. Uh, so one idea to start with is to look specifically at uh, beetles, which can be connected to, you know, depend on wetlands and the plants there, and then may reflect some kind of state, the status of, of, of the wetland. Uh, so this is a rather bold uh, project, I would say. We got funding anyways. <laughs> so uh, we are, uh, we will uh, look for, we're now looking for candidates so who will explore the, those huge data sets to get empirical correlations. We have 19 applicants for a PhD position. That's how we will collaborate between the departments. And we have soon interviews, and we have some good candidates, we think. And we envision that we will start this, this work in uh, January uh, 2018. So we look forward to, to that. So, thank you very much, Jan. Yeah, thanks. One quick question. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. We have, I mean, we have a lunch afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> you take it's time. quite interesting. I, I know nothing about Beatles, of course. But yeah. the, uh, one of the things that uh, it comes to mind of what uh, you're putting in there is that the difference between uh, construct, restore, and manage wetlands, etc., boils down to an issue which is essentially the age of water in storage because that would command uh, chemical composition of that. So, thereby, pr presumably, uh, uh, something um, in the direction that you're boldly, as you said, pointed out. But do you have any idea on how to measure that? Because it's um, it's an issue, actually. The age. The age of water in storage, not the fluxes. Okay. Which resonates time, says you, as you write. Right. So we haven't... Uh, yeah, we have ways. <laughs> there, there are many ways. We haven't thought of specific ways yet. But of course, it is an important question. I mean, what what... One very interesting aspect here, I don't know how much related it is to your question, is that these constructed wetlands are sometimes not even constructed where they used to be wetland. So, you know, they, they are in quite different places, which of course affects everything like, like you mentioned here. So it's, yeah. Anyways, we're in the making. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So, Let's move on to the last but not the least project uh, by Aiko. Please. Yes. Okay, so, so these three minutes I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, a project. So this is a slide of a project that is now ongoing in Ethiopia, and then I'll move to the to the building funded project. So the study is on coffee in southwestern Ethiopia, and here you see the life cycle of the of the coffee tree. So it originates the coffee, Arabica coffee from southwestern Ethiopia. So coffee has been interacting for probably ten thousands of years with different pests and pathogens within this landscape, and I'm particularly interested there in the fungal pathogens that attack the coffee. <laughs> But of course, since, since at least hundreds of years, the coffee also has a very important economic and cultural role within the Ethiopian society. So they produce a lot of coffee, and they consume at least half of this coffee, the coffee themselves. So the new question that we raised is this, how does climate change affect the cultivation of coffee in southwestern Ethiopia? And more specifically, this resulted in the following project which is on the relationship between climate, pathogens, and coffee yield, with the aim to optimize management for smallholder farmers. So coffee here is not grown by really big plantations or landowners, but by smallholder farmers who, who either have a forest plot or a kind of semi-forest or semi-plantation, small patches. So this is my first real interdisciplinary project, how I would call it. And here I summarized it in a very childish source very simple slide. So with Eric Shellstrom from
from SMHI, so these are the four partners in the first <coughs> We will try to answer the question, how will the micro and micro, macro climate change in the southwestern Ethiopian uh, uh, highlands? Which is a very important area for coffee. It's the only area in the world with a genetic reservoir for Arabica coffee. So if you want to do any further breeding, you should, you should really take care of this landscape. With Girma Adunya, a local plant pathologist, we will try to understand what is the impact of this predicted climate change on the fungal disease dynamics. And that includes the globally devastating coffee leaf rust, which is kind of threatening coffee production in Latin America and Asia. With Luba Buryasan, we want to use interviews and interviews. Uh, he's from Human Geography to understand how climate change and disease may affect the management decisions of the smallholder farmers. And coffee is grown in the understory, it's a shade grown crop. So one alternative is that farmers will switch to other cash crops, resulting in deforestation and huge changes in biodiversity. And finally, with Christopher, we want to look like how effective are these management decisions that the farmers can take, like 